So without further ado, let's jump right into it. <laughs> so next slide, please. So this is just a, a quick overview of the overall budget and kind of the major components of it. Uh, you'll see we've broken it out into th those major components. So on the town side, municipal, we're looking at the starting point for the conversation is a, about a 4.13% increase on the net basis. And, and incidentally, this is all uh, net numbers. Education side, it's uh, about a point higher at 5.3. County is remarkably coming in low this year. This is a point I do want to talk to the finance committee about. Uh, just as an aside, the county is switching from a calendar year to a fiscal year. And so uh, we have some decisions to make. Uh, there's a kind of a catch up six months and we've got some options to consider there. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, the capital budget, uh, there, there's a fairly robust uh, level of spending, particularly on the town side. The school is showing great restraint, uh, it seems, this year. Uh, but we have some really exciting and interesting projects that we'd like to bring to the council and, and to the community. We'll talk about some of them in some detail in a moment. Uh, one category that's kind of new and I broke out just for emphasis, I, I'll say, is, uh, is TIF revenues. Uh, this council's well aware over the last four or five months uh, a number of changes have been made in our two major TIF districts that have uh, really been done so to uh, increase the capture rate and, and also add flexibility in terms of how we use TIF revenues. So you see uh, this year we have over $2 million of TIF revenues. And uh, again, I have a further slide in the presentation that talks about how we're putting that money to use. Uh, and then uh, other is a catch-all. There's, uh, there's a little footnote there to, to know what goes into that. And all of this relates back to the tax rate comp sheet, uh, which is uh, something that the students of this process uh, are fairly uh, accustomed with. So that's a very quick overview, and we'd like to kind of go into a little more detail. Um, so next slide, please. For the town side, uh, I, I guess what emerged as a theme, we didn't start with this, but it, it became apparent. Um, I'm calling it responding to community needs. We had the very unique opportunity of having a community survey that gave us feedback and insight really like we don't have in a, in a typical uh, year. And uh, some of that guidance, um, my senior staff really took to heart in my suggestion and, and request. And not surprisingly, um, we did see a number of priorities being um, extended and, and some new priorities, uh, again, largely, um, at least in part, uh, shaped by some of that feedback from the community. I will say none of these projects are really out of the ordinary. There's, there's the sorts of things that we've been doing, but it's really gratifying to get community feedback that um, you know, these are things that we, they wanna see more of. So really quickly, we're looking to refresh our townwide transportation study. It's about 10 years old. Uh, this is an issue that uh, comes up time and time again, and it's, it's long overdue. Uh, that was something that was loud and clear through this study uh, survey. Uh, sidewalks, maintenance, and, and construction. We've got a couple of really exciting projects uh, we'll talk about in the capital plan uh, for new sidewalk uh, sections in town. And then we've, we've, we're embarking on a 10-year plan to maintain what we have um, and, and also provide winter maintenance uh, in a better, more consistent fashion. Uh, we're uh, redoubling our efforts for road resurfacing. So this is the typical paving. And our philosophy is uh, let's keep good roads good. Let's not let them deteriorate to the point that they need full reconstruction. Um, another comment we heard through the survey is residents were looking for more visibility of our police department, particularly in the neighborhoods. And we've, we've made some kind of low cost, no cost uh, changes in operations. Uh, but the best way to do it is put more boots on the ground. And we're proposing two new patrol officers to really enhance that, uh, that visibility townwide, but, but also the neighborhoods. And then there's a lot of conversation, an ongoing conversation around community center. Uh, we've not invested any resources to speak of. We've had tremendous work uh, at the staff level, I think, and committee level uh, with council involvement. But I think it's time, if we're serious about considering this, that we engage some professionals to help us better understand and define what we're talking about. So there's some resources uh, in here. And again, that was a, one of the major takeaways. We didn't ask the question, but that was one of the things that came out loud and clear through the comments uh, section of the survey. So that's just a quick overview and, and what I would characterize as kind of the theme of the municipal side of the budget. Next, please. Really quickly, uh, it might be helpful just to kind of understand what are the major drivers in our budget, kind of those change factors um, that, that are really driving some of the increases. 
Um, some of this is a, a broken record and, and you'll hear it from uh, the superintendent as well. Uh, health insurance is a big part of our budget. There's no question about that. And uh, looking at history gives us some suggestion of what to provide for uh, in terms of potential increases. We'll know these numbers by the time we get to the end of this process, but at this point we don't. So we need to carry a number and uh, we'll adjust accordingly. As I said earlier, we have uh, some new staff investments in public safety. Uh, just advance it again, please. So two in, two in police and then there's four fire positions. And uh, we'll get into great detail, I'm sure, at the finance committee level. But uh, given the nature of their 24-hour, seven-day-a-week shifts, uh, you know, one firefighter doesn't do you any good. You need to be able to cover all shifts. And so it's, it comes in increments of four, basically, to, to really make any noticeable difference. And then lastly, no surprise, we all see it in our household budgets, energy and fuel increases. And that's just a general comment across uh, really many of the lines, just general infl inflationary pressures. Uh, we feel it just like uh, the household budget does. So all of that totals up to about three quarters of a million dollars alone. And, and there's certainly uh, other major uh, other items as well. And, and a lot of decision points uh, along the way. Uh, but these are things that will certainly change over the next six weeks as we get better information. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, superintendent, and he's going to take you through the school side and, and I'll pick back up after. Thanks, Tom. And um, I just wanted to uh, share my thanks to, to Tom as Tom manager. It's been, um, you know, this is my first budget cycle here in Scarborough. Um, it's been just a wonderful experience and very collaborative. And there's so much sharing that goes on among departments in the town. And that's um, been super valuable to us as a school department, particularly uh, in the areas of technology and, and maintenance and, and everything else. And so it's really been um, impressive, actually. I've been very impressed with the degree of, of collaboration and the focus on students and on kids. Um, I think it's, it's probably, uh, you've probably heard this enough that, you know, the last two years, uh, all of the un unanticipated and unprecedented challenges we've faced in trying to educate our kids um, and, and also live our lives and, 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 and stay employed and go through all the disruptions of the last couple of years has been extremely challenging in, in, in every town. I've just been so impressed with um, how Scarborough has responded as a community. Um, I've, I've been, you know, the, the passion and dedication from our staff, um, from our students, from our parents, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like you're you're building the plane as you're flying it, right? Um, and we went from okay, we have an entire district, K to 12, every single school, and we can't use our buildings, so we have to learn how to educate kids remotely and and off campus completely, almost at a drop of a hat. We had to do that, and then we had to transition to a hybrid model, massive organizational change, um, where kids are either fully remote or part remote and part in person. And then finally, we were able to open our doors and, and open our schools again this fall and return to fully in-person uh, instruction with all of the additional health and safety measures um, and changes in protocols and all of those things. So that, uh, th those are three pretty massive organizational shifts inside of a two-year period. Um, and, and that doesn't happen well unless you have that degree of collaboration and just uh, professionalism and just straight up hard work. So um, the people that I've met and the community just really just kind of rolls up their sleeves and makes sure that we can do the best for our kids. So as far as um, our overall budget drivers, this is a pretty unique, continues to be a pretty unique um, budget cycle for schools. Um, some of the things that we're looking at is continuing to maintain our health and safety of students, staff, and community, and really focusing on that. Um, we're in kind of recovery mode. So um, we already have a lot of uh, uh, data to suggest that having the kids back in person with their teachers and with staff over the course of this year has been hugely impactful. Um, so We've also had to navigate a lot of changes in the SOP and um, CDC recommendations, all of those things. We've been able to follow that and keep kids in school throughout the entirety of this year and leading into next year. Um, 
we need to, to lead, continue to lead through this. Um, as far as the budget side of things, we also, over the course of the last couple of years, have had a huge infusion of federal funds. That's, 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 that's basically the spigot is being turned off. So we've got to figure out how to kind of um, take some of that money and, and move it. And then also not have this funding cliff where all of a sudden we've we've got to start cutting positions. So um, some of the things that, that we're really looking at is some of the, the economic impacts of the pandemic. So we've had some staff shortages and hiring challenges. All of these things um, have really driven how we've how we've built this budget. So um, and then also we we you know we're we're continuing to to work on things that are, are critical to our kids and staff, uh, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, social, emotional learning of, of kids, as well as um, ongoing curriculum work and professional development of our staff. So you, next slide. Um, another thing that I was particularly impressed with at all of our schools is, is, the, is the degree to which our principals and building leadership and staff really not just look at what they need, but what they may not need. And then how can we best use our resources um, to meet our needs, our changing needs as they evolve. So uh, I wanted to start with this slide just as an, as an example of the degree of specificity that our leadership council um, goes through line by line um, uh, uh, and where can we save to make sure that, that we're using the funds to directly impact uh, our students and support of our students. So just some examples, 200,000 for textbook and instructional subscriptions that, that no longer need to get renewed, 13,000 for supplemental instructional supplies. These are just examples of things that um, if you don't go line by line, you can miss. And, and that, that money adds up um, and, and can help fund um, additional supports that you may need in other areas. So if you go to the next slide. Um, what we're looking for for this year in terms of support for kids, and again, this is about really focusing on supporting the needs of our kids, both socially and emotionally and academically. The two uh, very much go hand in hand. So uh, a new student support academic ed educational technician three position at the middle school, uh, a new study center educational technician position at the high school, um, two social worker positions, one at the middle school and one at Wentworth, and then two additional special education service ed tech positions to support incoming K students. Um, and then we're also looking at, and this, this is another example of um, uh, significant collaboration with the town, we're, we're looking at coming up with a more efficient and effective way of scheduling um, all of our facilities across the district. Uh, it will require some additional work um, from our current uh, secretary and, and support for the, our athletics and activities. And then add a, adding unified uh, bocce to the high school athletics program. And I don't know if anyone's experienced uh, a unified game um, either at our middle, middle school or high school. I actually got to play in one, which was pretty fun, but um, it is, it, it will, it will just, it's, it's amazing. It's it, the, the program is, is so important and the experience it gives our kids 100% translates into their development in the classroom and their experience in school. It's, uh, it's really pretty amazing to watch and to be a part of. Um, the other piece of this is, a, is and, and this is in the executive summary too, a really um, clear breakdown of all the, all the federal COVID grant monies, how they were spent, um, and then building in that contingency so that, so that we're able to con continue to fund into this budget some positions so that it's not having to cut you know, 10 positions in one year and really kind of step down and then really assess, okay, what do our kids need? And making sure that uh, we have the resources and that we're using the resources from the federal government through the, the COVID grants and, and, the, and those funds to make sure that um, we're supporting the needs of our kids. So there are, there are some things in this budget that are, that are funded through uh, the, the remains or what's left over of the ESSER three funding 
um, for teacher positions to continue to maintain small class sizes as part of our, our kind of recovery and getting back to more normal operations as a, as a school department and more normalized operations any, anyway. Um, a full guidance counselor for the K-2 schools, summer academies in July and August, again, to um, provide additional support for students, uh, specialized reading instructions for special services, and then a supplemental one-to-one -one educational technician for incoming kindergartner needs. And again, that has to do with um, you know, uh, students who, who are already working with CD, CDS before they're of school age. And then as, as you know, Tom was describing, we have um, you know, the, the costs of doing business and of um, keeping the personnel and programs that we have in place moving forward. Um, you know, we, we're starting, we're in negotiations for um, the uh, teachers, which is, which is our largest um, contractual and CBA negotiations so that, so that that's a big number. Um, and then as, as Tom, Tom mentioned earlier, uh, our increase, uh, budgeted health increase, that's not, that's not the number, that's the highest it could be. So that's what we're budgeting for uh, the health insurance increase. And then we also, um, special services, additional, the two additional social workers and two educational technicians uh, necessary to meet our, our special services and special needs requirements. Um, increases in instructional technology. One of the one of the things that came out of our uh, remote and hybrid models is a significant investment um, in technology for all of our students, K through 12, uh, and then you've got to continue to maintain that technology and maintain that investment. Um, and then, you know, anyone who's filled their oil tank recently knows the uh, energy and fuel costs are a challenge. Um, next slide. And then as uh, Tom noted as the first part of uh, uh, his slides, and we'll continue talking about it, the total education um, general fund operating budget, the percent change is 6.20, 6.40 increase in the total educational budget. We do have an increase in non-tax revenues, which brings in the tax request at 5.31%. And that's the school side. Thank you. This is uh, in part, I guess, the Mutual Admiration Society. I, I do want to, I, I was just gratified by hearing uh, Jeff's comments just about the collaboration. Um, I've been here long enough to have maybe taken that for granted. And it's just great to hear an outside perspective kind of reinforcing that, that what we do here in Scarborough is, is really quite unique and it doesn't happen at this level uh, in many other communities, if any. So um, we just forget about that when we're so close to it sometimes. Um, so thank you for making mention of that. From the capital side, I, I didn't wanna bore you with all the particulars. Uh, this is a big part of our conversation, I hope, uh, with the finance committee and we'll go into great detail. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just kind of show you uh, kind of the fruits of some of the, the labor over the last few years. So we've got a fairly substantial capital request, uh, just about 13 million in total. Uh, a number of these projects are not gonna be new to you. They've kind of been coming through the planning process uh, in one form or another. But what really the takeaway I wanna leave you with tonight is that we're starting to find different ways to fund these. Uh, whereas historically it was almost all bonding. And, and to be fair, a fair amount of that still is, you know, 9 million of that. But uh, we've been able to build uh, equipment reserves uh, on the school side last year and the town has, uh, has a modest reserve. Uh, those monies are now coming back into play. And, and you can see $700,000 are, are coming from different reserves. Uh, we're also trying to convert uh, and be smarter about what we bond. Uh, we do have a fiscal and financial policy that um, helps uh, us understand what should be capital, what should be funded through long-term uh, borrowing and what should we pay for as we go. So there's a fairly substantial amount to be appropriated uh, because of the type of item it is or project it is uh, and it's, it's uh, life expectancy and, and overall cost. And lastly, and we'll, we'll go into a, a little more detail is uh, there's a fair amount of ARPA funds, uh, about $1.5 million in ARPA funds that we're proposing to bring into this budget. And uh, in a slide or two, I'll uh, dive in a little deeper on that. In fact, the next one, if you would. So the town was awarded, uh, awarded 
uh, allocated, I guess, uh, just over $2.2 million. And that was based on a nationwide formula, uh, population-based, as I recall. Um, we've gone through trials and tribulations with US Treasury, uh, finally issuing a, a final rule. So we now have clear guidance and there's a, you know, there's some runtime on this. So we have a, a better sense of uh, claiming the funds and that's been made much easier and also how we can put them to use. Um, it's very tempting to uh, use these funds because we could to supplant existing operating costs, um, but that's it's one-time money and we're just kind of setting ourselves up for a challenge in the future. So I'm proposing that we really look at one-time expenditures really in the capital side uh, of the budget. Uh, and my proposal, uh, I should mention that this council has already approved about $400,000 in, in that allocation, uh, that, that going for premium pay for essential workers, and then also more recently some voting um, booth upgrades um, that the clerk um, desperately needs. Uh, for FY23, we're proposing the purchase of two new ambulances. Uh, we think there's a very good connection and it's certainly qualified uh, for use. Um, we're also proposing to fund a major new project. This would be construction of a sidewalk on a portion of uh, Spur Rink Road. It's kind of the first phase. That's a $890,000 um, item. I think will be well, well, should be well received in the community. And uh, we, when we relocated, uh, we relocated the message board from the old public safety building to a brand new sign out front. And it, you know, within two months of putting it in, uh, uh, it, it broke down and we can't repair it. So uh, we'd like to repair that. I think that would um, be well used for general community use, but also town and school activities and making notice of public meetings and so on and so forth. So I think it's something desperately needed. Um, I, I just wanna loop back to the ambulances. Our historical practice has been to use in, uh, uh, EMS revenues uh, for all of our ambulance runs to cover these capital expenses. The two years of the pandemic really, uh, at least the first year, significantly reduced our revenues. Folks simply weren't calling for service. They probably still needed it, but uh, they were afraid to go to the hospital and consequently uh, we were caught up in that same sort of fear. And so um, we'll, I think those, uh, those practices and those revenues will rebound as soon as this, this year. And in fact, this year looks very promising. But well, that's left us with a position where we don't have additional funds to be able to make this capital purchase. So I think we'll be able to cycle back to that traditional method as soon as that gets back on track. So I think that's, a, I guess, another reason where we see ARPA funds being really a good use. It kind of bridges a gap for us. Next, please. The other thing uh, I just wanted to highlight, it's a, it's a new and different thing. I made mention uh, early on, uh, this council is quite aware uh, of the changes you've made to our uh, major TIF, uh, TIFs in town. Uh, that is already producing significant additional revenue in the TIF account. And uh, the, 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 the difference with uh, TIF revenues is they are limited in terms of what you can use them for, as opposed to simply coming in as general tax revenue, uh, unrestricted for use. It's at your convenience, uh, these have, these have uh, fairly stringent regulations as to uh, where they can be spent. And, and I credit the council for being um, thoughtful and being as flexible as we can in that regard. Uh, as these, particularly the downtown TIF, as that picks up and accumulates more and more funds, I think we're gonna have even more and more opportunities. In this year, I'm proposing a fairly simple um, approach uh, that will cover the, the funds we expect for next year. So for the Hargis Parkway TIF, uh, we need to satisfy our final credit enhancement payment to New England Expedition. That will be done next year. And then the remainder we're proposing to go directly against the debt service, uh, which happens to be its final debt service payment in FY23 as well. Won't cover all of it, but we'll cover uh, about half of it at this point. And then we'll have time to um, pay ourselves back for the deficit that's been created. On the downtown TIF, uh, we are proposing to cover half of the public safety building debt. Uh, that was one of the allowed uses that uh, we've included. And we're looking to cover the entirety of SETCO costs. This is something that we've always had available to us. We've never chosen to. We now have the resources to be actually able to do that. Um, we'll get into some particulars if the finance committee wants to, but uh, in FY23, these are dollars that we were already spending uh, in our budget. 
because of the way these programs work, the tax shift benefits will accrue two and three years from now. So um, I can't say that we're not enjoying the benefits in FY23, but we're, we've set up the system for that to, to be coming our way. And it was important, I think, uh, to begin the practice of uh, doing this on a regular basis. The final point I'll just remind the council of, uh, you self-imposed a requirement that all TIF expenditures will be done through the budget process. And so it's done in the course of a larger conversation about uh, the entire priorities as opposed to uh, individually throughout the year. So I think that was a very wise move and I expect you'll see a consistent uh, conversation uh, from this podium in, years, in the year's future. Next, please. Uh, items in motion and, and to save Jeff from standing up, I'll just cover his as well. Uh, we have some new staff investments. You know, we can survive without them. Uh, so those, I'll, I'll characterize them in motion. We, we would very much like to have a, a deliberate, thoughtful talk about the value of, of that investment. Um, the assessor uh, wanted to be true to his words and has monies in his budget to conduct, uh, start the, the in-house revaluation. Uh, he has an exhibit that actually recommends us, uh, recommends that we delay that a year, but I thought it was important to include that money in the budget uh, so we can have that conversation. And then I think on the revenue side, uh, excise, I'm being very cautious. Uh, I have not increased the, uh, um, this has been the juggernaut for the entire time I've been here. It's increased year over year and it may well again, uh, but it strikes me with some of the uh, challenges with getting new automobiles. I, I think we're going to see not as many new cars being purchased uh, in this calendar year, and that will affect uh, excise revenues. On the other side, uh, all the new residents that have moved into our town, um, they're registering their car here for the first time, and maybe two or three cars. So uh, I may, you know, that's some good news, I suspect, uh, and I'll look for your collective guidance in uh, kind of reading the tea leaves and understanding where that might be. But I think there's there's some extra revenue there and it's a discussion point we ought to have. And then for revenue sharing, we noticed that the formula that the state uses is using a 2019 population estimate. Well, we all know that there's now 2020 actual census data and um, Karen Martin um, has been kind enough to wade into this a bit and is uh, we're taking the issue up uh, with the state to see if uh, it just doesn't make sense that they won't use the best information available. Uh, that one change would would increase about three hundred thousand dollars to us if they simply use the updated uh, estimate, which they have used countless times in other formulas. So um, I don't know if we'll be successful, but I, we're going to continue to pursue that. And then on the school side, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I think all the collective bargaining agreements are open, and so there are resources. Uh, a, a bit, you know, included in the budget to to cover the financial component of those, however they settle out. Anthem rates, is, uh, health rates, is, as was, was mentioned. And then of course the enrollment in special services, that's something that can change day to day as I understand it. And so that's something that uh, we'll look for them to keep us advised. We need to be uh, ready and, and, and able to serve the needs of the kids uh, when they present themselves. So the bottom line, uh, the net budget is up 7.4%. Luckily, we continue to have very robust growth in our uh, valuation. Uh, the council has a policy which simply takes 90% as a baseline, 90% of the increase from last year. Uh, but it also gives me the manager the opportunity to um, do something different if there's a valid reason I'm doing something different. Um, so we're about a $118 million increase uh, over last year. Coincidentally, that's about the same increase. So it's about 100%. And I have uh, a pretty high degree of confidence. Uh, the assessor has been very helpful in helping me understand those, those different components. So I'm, I'm confident in uh, including that as part of my recommendation uh, as part of this evaluation. And so all of that results in a, a projected mill rate increase of about 4.8%. Of course, your goal is at 3%. And um, next slide, just very quickly, uh, I think history is the best uh, indicator. This is just a 10 year look back. I would note, uh, I would ask you to focus on the right hand column. And I would note the years 2019 and 2020 ought to really be thrown out. That was the two years of the reval. So I don't think those are very good indicators. But uh, if you look back at history and, and the, the more recent history, We've been hovering right around one uh, percent for the last two years, so I'm I have no doubt that we'll uh, if if it's the council's will, we'll be able to meet your budget goal. 
but hopefully only after we have uh, robust discussion and deliberation around the priorities. And a couple of final ones, just uh, in terms of how to stay engaged as we go through this process. Uh, we will have a communications plan um, much like we did the last couple of years. And that layers in a bunch. It really leverages all of our resources, uh, our partnership and, and opportunity with the leader. Also our uh, e-newsletter, which comes out on a uh, by uh, weekly basis at this point. Uh, and then all of our other resources as well. Uh, we are in a position of uh, still doing hybrid meetings. So I think anyone who has an interest in attending and, and participating in our meetings can from the convenience of their home or their office. Um, and I kindly put both the council and the BOE's uh, email addresses should they have any questions. By all means, myself and staff are available as well. Uh, this budget and of course my presentation here will be available starting first thing in the morning and through the budget portal. And lastly is just kind of the process that uh, as it lays out over the next six weeks or so. So obviously tonight uh, we start the process. Uh, school board will do its own adoption process, including first reading, public hearing, and second reading. Uh, the council has its as well. Uh, that starts next Wednesday on the 6th. Uh, we'll be convening a joint meeting of the school board and the town council on May 4th. And all of that culminates in the school validation vote uh, on June 14th. Uh, at your places this evening, you had a budget book. Uh, our school colleagues uh, were each supplied one as well. I, I won't spend the time to kind of go through and orient it. Hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory. If not, um, we do try to provide a fair amount of content, uh, both narrative to provide the context for you but also the uh, entire line item detail for both town and school was there should you want to uh, look at that level of detail. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, the finance committee will do its part to, to dig deep and ask lots of questions. And uh, I suspect they're very interested in having anyone attend those meetings and be part of that proceeding if you wish. So we stand ready and I hopefully able uh, to assist you as you go through this journey. Thank you guys. Um, that was great. And just to be clear, this will be available electronically yes. on the town's website tomorrow. Yeah, I'd prefer not copying it for people. So please view it. Me as well. If anybody needs a copy, I, I have one available. Um, so uh, I wanted to re reiterate one of your slides there that, that showed, you know, four years ago, we had a 0% tax increase. Three years ago, it was minus 10. It was 1% increase two years ago and then 1% last year. Um, so having been here all those years, this is one of the better starting points that I can um, mm -hmm. recall being proposed uh, in terms of the impact to the taxpayer. So I think we're at a good starting point. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we, you know, we set some goals or objectives as a council that we'll be able to uh, land squarely well within uh, you know, what we put forth. Um, Jeff, you mentioned some of the transitions and adaptations that the council, and you made me um, feel guilty. So I was complaining earlier today about sitting in a new seat. I don't have Paul to run the, the computers and, you know, at, at the flip of a switch, you're all of a sudden trying to educate what 3,000 students uh, without a classroom. And so, uh, yeah, I'm humbled now. So, uh, <laughs> that's, that's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Any questions for, for Tom or Jeff? Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, and I'll direct these to Tom, if I, if I may. So, um, first of all, you know, thanks for the work. And, you know, this is uh, an enormous task that you, you make it look easy. We know it's not. Um, and this is my fourth time through the budget process. So it's, uh, yeah, every year it's learn something new. <laughs> Can you tell us, were there any special assumptions you uh, and the school have taken uh, in view of what appears to be... Um, some storm clouds on the economic horizon uh, concerning inflation, concerning a downturn of the business cycle uh, and so forth. Is there anything that you can point to that has guided your budget work this year to take into account those things? Uh, I mentioned it uh, in passing. I think the excise revenue is, is a watch area because uh, I think that's very sensitive to consumer behavior. Uh, beyond that, many of our revenue sources, certainly the state revenue sources, they are experiencing record 
uh, both sales and income tax receipts to, to the extent that they're returning um, significant money back to taxpayers. And so uh, that appears to be fairly stable so revenue source for us. Our revenue sources are extremely stable. Uh, uh, you know, property values luckily don't uh, aren't affected by these kind of short-term economic factors. Long-term, they may have a, a bit of a tailing effect, uh, but that's certainly nothing that we need to worry about for next year. In terms of uh, you know inflationary factors, I think we have taken that into account, and our uh, our requests, appropriation requests, uh, do reflect uh, what we um, anticipate in the coming twelve months. Great, thank you. Number two of three questions. It was a process question. Um, so I'm looking at the calendar and I'm trying to get my head around, um, you know, I seem to recall that we had fairly extensive departmental reviews at one point in time. When, when and where will there be an opportunity for the public and also for the council to, to have those reviews? Certainly. Uh, if I could direct your attention to page 20 of the book. This is a tentative schedule. Um, I already know from meeting with uh, Mrs. Seiler today that we're going to have to modify some things. Uh, so I think uh, we'll do that fairly quickly as soon as next the uh, first meeting next week. And with the revised schedule, we'll make certain to get the public aware of what that schedule is and publish it. Uh, so these these are all public proceedings, uh, and and uh, and the public and councilors are encouraged to come and be part of that process. So um, I. So am, is it, am I correct in saying that most of that will take place in the finance committee meetings, not in a town council meeting or a special workshop? Correct. That's been the historical practice that the finance committee really runs that detailed review process for the council and produces a, typically a series of recommended adjustments uh, at the end of that process. Okay. And the final question, three of three is, uh, and I forgive me if I can't quote the number, but I seem to recall that we have an obligation that may be a financial policy requirement or someplace in the charter to maintain a certain unrestricted fund balance. You've got a, a slide on this on page 18. So can you confirm for us what the requirement is and how successful we've been or not in terms of achieving that? Yeah, I believe you're referencing uh, the kind of self-imposed, uh, you know, no other entity uh, has a requirement. We've created some internal requirements uh, in large part to, because it's good prudent finance, but it also helps our bond rating to, to show healthy fund balances. Uh, essentially, we, we cannot dip below 8.33%, uh, 8, 8 uh, but it, uh, there's aspirational goals at 10% and 12%. And uh, when we attend the, attain those certain goals, uh, there's certain further instructions as to what to do with the uh, additional fund balance at that point. Okay, so my, my final question on that is, so it, if you look at the bar chart, we did pretty well, you know, in terms of keeping that number down through mm -hmm. you know, 20, 2011 through 2016, you know, we were, you know, over the limit on 2017 and the past, uh, you know, three or four years, it's been kind of hovering. So my question is, is there anything we're going to do specifically to try to get that number back to where well, let, let's keep in mind, uh, fund balance is created because we've uh, raised more money. We haven't spent all the money that we've raised. And so this is taxpayer money. So yes, it's good to have a healthy fund balance, but I think too much is, is not appropriate. So we don't take any uh, specific actions to build fund balance. We don't budget it. Uh, it's a function of our annual budget performance. And so uh, one of the reasons that um, I, I think that we haven't been able to make great strides in fund balance is that we have pretty tight budgets and there's and those margins are fairly limited at the end of the year. Um, and so, uh, no, we don't have any specific strategies to build fund balance. And there was no opportunity to use ARPA or COVID funding for this. No, in fact, that was a, an absolute prohibition. That was uh, crystal clear, uh, very tempting. Everyone would have just tucked it away for a rainy day. And uh, explicitly that's not allowed. You never know if you don't ask. No, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, it, more to your point, uh, we do have the audit th that is uh, uh, you know, ready to be shared with you. So we'll look to schedule with leadership uh, that session. I think that will be an opportunity to get into a much deeper level of fund balance discussion. Thank you. Any other questions? 
see that we have some of the school board here. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Appreciate you, you all coming. Okay. Thank you. Well, with that, I think that concludes today's meeting. If there's no objections, um, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.